basically a really well-known Formula One driver who's right-click saved three pictures of mine off Twitter. And then like that night, I saw that he had put it on his Instagram and social media channels and um, had basically just stolen it off Twitter. Like, that is the voice of Jamie Price. And if you've been following any kind of motorsport in the last five years, chances are you've seen his work. He is a motorsport photojournalist who's been taking pictures of fast moving things professionally since 2011. His portfolio has images of Formula One, the World Endurance Championship, Lamborghini Super Trofeo, as well as other sporting events worldwide, including horse racing, the NFL, and just about everything in between. On this episode of the show, we're talking with the incredibly busy and incredibly talented Jamie Price. And just a quick note, our conversation was recorded right before he kicked off his traveling year with the 24-hour race in Daytona, Florida, so that's why he might be talking about that in the future tense. Anyways, on with the show. This is Garage Easter Radio. Thanks for tuning in. locked up his tyres, got the line, and he's back into second position on the last lap but one, and the French crowd aren't very happy. I was in college uh, my parents gave me a nikon d80 dslr which was the basic entry level system that nikon used at the time it's kind of a um, competitor to the canon rebel which has been hugely popular but they gave me that camera for my 21st birthday and at the time i was a, a competitive swimmer so i was a four-year college swimmer and i was also riding steeplechase racehorses for not a living but semi-professionally. Um, we call them conditional riders, so you're getting paid but not a lot. So I was doing both of those things simultaneously while I was a student in college and my parents, when they gave me that camera, I just decided to start essentially documenting the the swim meets that I was competing in as well as like the horse races that I was competing in. So I would ride a race and then help cool the horse out and do all that other stuff that is required of being a jockey. And then once I was done with that, I would just grab the camera and no one's gonna stop. Like these race meets are pretty low key. You know, I know, I knew most of the officials, I knew most of the, the other riders and the trainers, so I could just walk back out onto the course and like shoot the next race and not really need credentials or anything just because I'm still in like riding boots and silks and would just take pictures of my friends riding and the races and eventually I started getting paid to cover those races and not just ride in them so it was kind of it became like a balancing situation where I had to decide is it worth it to keep riding or should I you know make some more money d taking pictures and while I love riding and I still miss being on a racehorse and and having that experience, it it's so dangerous that at a certain point I was going to get hurt doing it. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So I eventually chose the photography route and not the professional jockey route. It was a huge adrenaline rush, but I miss that. But I. I get my adrenaline rush in other ways now. And steeplechase is like jumping over obstacles and through water, and it's it's not just a, a track, right? Yeah. So there's still there's still thoroughbred race horses like you'd see in the Derby or the Grand National in England, but they're generally pretty uniform jumps. But there's between 12 and 14 jumps that are four feet high or so, and you're still hitting them at 30 miles an hour on a on a horse um, that is born and bred to run. So it's pretty exciting, and and it's. It's honestly very similar to motorsport in a lot of ways. So it was a pretty easy transition to start covering car racing from covering horse racing. And both of those, I imagine, are pretty tight communities to to kind of break into. And once you you kind of have an in, like you said, you're you're running around and you don't even really need a credential at these these smaller races. But 
Yeah, you don't. And it's a lot of fun because it is a tight community and you have a lot of friends and you know people and you walk into the, the paddock at a horse race or you walk into the paddock at a you know smaller car race or even some of the bigger car races. Everybody knows everybody and it's just, it's a community, it's a family. They are very, very similar and, and a lot of people find that surprising, but they're very similar in, of how things kind of flow. And But I think that horse racing probably is more similar to bike racing because it's kind of a more like laid back atmosphere um, and not necessarily kind of the uptight uh, corporate. You never know what you're going to get when you walk into the Formula One paddock. It's just kind of, it's just uptight. But Horse racing is a lot more like bike racing where everybody's kind of living on the edge and having fun and smiling and it's good. So you come out of college, you kind of have some, you know, experience taking pictures and did you see this as a career for yourself or was it just kind of a, you fell into it or how did that happen? Um, I didn't see it as a career or a really viable career until I was probably a junior or senior in college that I started really thinking like this is something that I would like to pursue. I did a few internships, um, but honestly, I thought that my photography career would probably go toward the wedding photography side just because there's no shortage of weddings. Everybody gets married and you can charge good money for it. And I thought that I would probably end up doing weddings and I did do weddings for a little while off and on, but I, I didn't really see it as like especially the motorsport and the automotive side, I didn't really see it as something that I could do for a living until like the year after college that things started kind of really snowballing a little bit. I think that's a lot of people that are interested in photography. I mean, if you go to a race, it seems like every other person that's a spectator has a camera and, you know, just like a fairly nice cameras and they're there to take pictures. But it doesn't seem like a lot of people see this as there's ways to make money in, in motorsport. Obviously, you've proven that there's there certainly is, you know, money to be made and teams need photographers. And it still surprises me because when you look around at some of these races and especially the bigger races out in Asia, you see people in the grandstands with like ridiculous gear that's way better than mine like i have sec like two or three generations behind current gear and uh i like i'll be looking up in the grandstands and i'll see somebody with a brand new canon you know 1dx with a 600 f4 i mean they're they're literally holding you know 12 to thirteen thousand dollars worth of gear on their shoulder and Maybe they do photography for a side passion, but most of the people that are like real pro photographers in a certain country will be there covering that event because it's a big event. It's like it's like having the Olympics in your country. So you see so many people, even at Daytona and Sebring, you just, everybody has a camera and there is tons of money to be made in it. It's just, it's getting harder, but it's a small community. There's. There's, there's work, but there's not a, a lot of work. Do you see that the, the barrier to entry is getting lower for photography now that everyone, you can get a decent camera for and lens for 500 bucks or so? And I think that the older guys that I, that I know that have been doing motorsport photography for 20, 30, 40, 50 years in some cases, they would say yes, 100%. I would say that it, it hasn't really changed since I got into it five or six years ago, really. Technology has changed a lot and you can you can get a, a quality lens and camera and show up at a race and have, you know, the ability to, to get great pictures, but you still need talent and you still need like an understanding of business to make it work because at the end of the day, photography is not any different than any other business you have to sell. It's a, it's a product that you're selling. Um, in, in this case, you're selling yourself as a product as well as the product that you make. So it's kind of like you're selling two things at once. That's really where I see people that like they have one or the other. They can make pictures, but they can't sell those pictures or they can sell those pictures and they can't necessarily make nice pictures, but they can still sell not nice pictures and make a good living off of it. And I'm not going to say any names or anything, but there's some people that I'm like, I, I just don't get it. Like they're they're basically out there just pushing the button and they're still making great money at it and it's because they can they have they have an understanding of business and and they know people and that's that's what it comes down to is just networking i can definitely see how that's a, that's the case so kind of snowballing off that is it is it hard to differentiate yourself or your brand from other photographers 
how do you kind of avoid being a commodity in this industry? Just someone there to, like you said, press a button. Um, I think a lot of it boils down to being a person. You know, if we all are standing at a corner taking pictures, we're all going to get a different picture, but we're all going to get something sort of kind of similar. Maybe it like might look completely different, but at the end of the day, we're all different people. So it really comes down to you're a person and I'm selling myself as a person. You know, the photography side it, side of it comes a little bit second to that. And I still have to make pictures and I still have to make something that's creative and different. But at the end of the day, I'm out there as the, like, I've built those relationships with people that I've now have as friends, but they hopefully would like to continue to hire me because we've now built that relationship and it has very little to do with photography. So on the business side of things, are you mainly employed by teams, drivers, um, publications? All of the above. I will, I will work for anybody that wants to pay. Um, that's kind of where I am in my career right now, is instead of taking every job that comes my way, I kind of need to start scaling back and taking the right jobs and taking the jobs that are are worth that money or worth my time um, because I can't do it all. And like Daytona, this this coming weekend uh, at Daytona is going to be really challenging because I'm very fortunate, but I have a ton of clients and it ranges from sponsors, editorial magazines, um, teams, drivers, you know, like literally everything. And I've probably taken on too much and it's going to be a stressful week. And so where I'd like to go with my career is that I want to scale that back and not take everything that comes my way. When you're 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 hired by a team to cover an event like the the 24 hours, are you sending them images throughout the race or do you publish them afterwards? How does that how does that work for you? Um, it depends on the client and honestly it depends on how much they're paying because that's that's something that I'll factor into like the more you pay me the harder I'm going to work essentially. So if like for some teams you know, they need pictures pretty regularly throughout the race. So yeah, you have 24 hours, but you would be amazed how quickly 24 hours goes. And especially when you break it down into like small parts of a day where you have like pre-dawn, sunrise, mid-morning, like mid-afternoon, and then the light starts getting good again. Those times are really like two to three hours and you're going to spend two to three hours sitting in the media center occasionally just editing and ingesting and it's like that that back end of the work where you have to really pick and choose when you're going to be back in there so i can't deliver to a client every 30 minutes it's just impossible and especially with somewhere like Le Mans or Daytona or even Sebring, they're big tracks and you you aren't going to be able to just hop back to the media center and send them a picture as like an update. You know, there's there's agencies that are able to do that and they have a technician that's sitting there editing people's pictures during the race, but I don't have that. So it's all up, up to me to figure out how my day is going to go and kind of plan it as best as I can. So you mentioned um, like an agency, like a, a, and we see all these pictures watermark with LAT images, LAT images or Sutton um, or um, I can't remember any of the other ones, but was that ever, did you ever think about kind of getting involved with an agency like that? Or were you always kind of set on being your own boss? With regards to Formula One, I do work with an agency and we do spit out images ridiculously quickly and it's cool. I really enjoy it with a formula one race one of us will be shooting the start of the race from turn one and we'll have an attachment on the camera itself that is connected to the either the cellular network or the wi-fi network at a track and we'll send a picture once the once the cars like actually start racing each other like five lights go out and all that there will be a picture online on autosport or on crash or on espn within like 30 seconds it's it's ridiculous that's how they do that is they have a person that's sitting there and is is saying you know you can have these pictures and we'll have them up as quick as we can during the race at certain times or if somebody crashes they're going to have an immediate picture of that because one of us is going to be in that area that will have that picture but with the work that i do i'm a one-man band i would love to be able to hire somebody to do 
editing, but it, that's part of it. That's part of what I'm selling is myself as an as an editor, and I have a style that's different to all of my colleagues just because of you know how I edit. You know, you don't have a lot of time to to do that, so somebody is really working really hard, like. With Formula One, we'll be sending pictures back to England. So it goes to our computer, which goes to England, which then gets distributed to the web um, and to various clients for Formula One teams and sponsors that need pictures really quickly. So I want to talk about your technique and how you approach a track uh, and how you plan out your shot. If you're heading to a, a track that you haven't shot at yet, yeah, how would you approach that? I'm a, I guess a Gen X um, guy, but I kind of use any tool that's available to me. And one of the tools that I personally choose is I will play Project Cars on my Xbox One. And the Formula One game on Xbox is pretty good too. Anything that I can use to learn a track before I even get there is hugely beneficial. With Project Cars, you can tell it to be four, five, six o'clock at night, or one, two, three in the morning, or four, five, six o'clock in the morning. And it is genuinely realistic to how and where the sun comes up. Like at Le Mans, it's a huge track and you can really learn where the sun is coming up. And you can, when you're driving around in the game, if you're driving straight at the sun, you know that spot's going to be really good in the morning because that's what you want. You want that golden light or you want those those vibrant colors and you can use the game to learn the track, but you can also use the game to learn racing lines and where the cars are going to be really hitting the rumble strips or in areas where that they aren't. So if I haven't been to a track before and it does feature in one of the games that I have, I'll, I'll really use the game to learn that track as much as I can. It really does tell you a lot about a track or the, even elevation a little bit. Um, and a lot of these games have photography modes where you can take pictures and kind of play with those settings. Yeah, they're incredible. Project Cars too is really, it's, you know, you can choose everything, your aperture, your focus distance, all that stuff. It's, it's really nice, and the, especially since the, the tracks are laser scanned to, you know, three millimeters of what they are in real life. It, it must be an incredible asset for you. It is. Yeah. And it's amazing the level of detail that they put into the game. You know, I give the, the developers huge, huge props because it is it's photorealistic and you can learn a lot. Yeah, that's really cool. So. What's your hit rate as far as, you know, how many pictures you take and then from those, how many are, are going to be good? Generally, what I've found is that I'm getting about a 10% hit rate of pictures that I've, I've taken, but pictures that are like, those are keepers um, or stuff that I would deliver to clients. It's not, it's not very high and maybe even less than that. Like the stuff that gets uploaded to Instagram or my website on a portfolio type level is like the the one percent of the one percent of the one percent it takes a lot of experience to begin to to see which pictures work and which ones don't if i have to if i have to sift through two or three thousand four thousand pictures in a day i don't really care because i know i know that my memory cards can handle that and i know my computer can handle it and i know that i can go through them pretty quickly and not have to worry and i know that i'll have the pictures that i need out of that set do you struggle between the creative stuff and the stuff that your clients need that was that's part of the what i was saying earlier about is if, if i've taken on too many clients then i have to i have to deliver those kind of those boring bog standard like front three quarter everything sharp the all the sponsors are sharp the numbers sharp you can see the driver you have to deliver those to those clients but you also have you've also been hired as an artist as a person as as somebody that's different from everybody else so i've found that the more clients that i take on the the crappier my work gets and it's kind of it's really frustrating because you're like man i'm making good money this weekend but my pictures suck because i don't have time to go out there and enjoy any of it like you're just running from time from spot to spot for her honestly for 24 hours part of me is like i love a 24-hour race there's nothing like it 
but I'm dreading next weekend because I know that it's going to be hard, hard work and I'm not going to get a minute to sit down or eat or sleep. And I really hope that my pictures don't suffer for it. Um, and they always do, especially the second, the second part of the race, like from, from 11 to two on Sunday sucks. <laughs> it's bad. Well, do you find that the more, um, creative shots, do they kind of strengthen your personal brand as you're talking about? Like, do they, do clients start to know you as that guy that took that one picture or? The problem is, is you're only as good as, as your, as your next picture or your last picture in some cases, it just doesn't matter what you did two or three years ago and everybody can be like, oh, I love that picture, but that's not going to get you hired for tomorrow. And I go back to these tracks so many different times that you start really repeating a little bit and you you know what's good and you know what's not good. And, and I know where it's not worth going to. Like one of my friends will be like, hey, I'm going to go out to turn five. I'm like, ah, turn five sucks. I'm not going. But I should go because if I go back, I know that I might do something different or be forced to do something different. And then I'd, I'd come away with something better than I've had last year. I shoot in a different way or I've, you know, the light's different than the last time I was there. There's a lot of different ways that you approach it, but it's that's like a human condition problem where you just we get lazy. It doesn't matter who you are. You're just I know that I've been out to that turn and I know that I don't like it and it doesn't really suit my style or the sun isn't in the right spot there, even at the best of times. But going off that, are there good and bad tracks to shoot at? Oh, yeah. Some of the tracks just suck. I struggle just to to get anything nice out of it. And then some tracks, the pictures, it doesn't matter what you do, you could trip and and hit your camera button and you'd still come away with amazing pictures just because of just because of how easy the track is or how iconic or how close you can get to the cars like monaco i don't think you can make a bad picture in monaco i wanted to ask you about one or really two pictures there's one of uh i think it was two years ago uh, it's Alonso and McLaren, um, but you get these overhead shots in Monaco. I mean, is it hard, it's especially there, you know, finding places to get more interesting shots where you're, you're looking overhead or the Nico Hülkenberg shot from this past year where it lined up so nicely with the yellow line and got really a lot of attention? A lot of those pictures come from relationships that people build. And I've built a relationship with a company that has hospitality suites on top of one of the, the apartment buildings in Monaco. And I was introduced to this guy a couple years ago and he was like, hey, come on up if you wanna like come shoot qualifying or something, just give us a few pictures, take some shots of the table setups and people drinking champagne. I was like, done. Like I went up there and I it's on the very top floor of one of the tallest apartment building is like right overlooking the harbor and you can see straight down if i dropped the lens it would it would fall onto the track like not next to the track not into the trees next to the track like it would fall onto the track so you are directly above the cars and it's so cool and but it just it's from a relationship that i built through a, a mutual friend and you know i've i've been fortunate to go up to that spot um the last couple of years and as a trade, I give them a few pictures, people drinking champagne, and, and they can put a few pictures in in the branding that they do. It's worth it, because that, that ticket for that qualifying session is worth a couple thousand dollars. But that's a lot of what Monaco is, is you build a relationship with somebody that owns an apartment. Um, and one of my clients in Lamborghini owns an apartment in Monaco, and so he's offered to have me come up next year. So I kind of want to go see it, and maybe it's a great shot, and maybe it's the next thing because no one, there, there might not have been anybody that's been up to that apartment ever before to shoot car racing up there. It just may not have been an, an option. And if he invites me, I, it's like my duty to go check it out at least. As far as getting credentialed for all these these racing series, is it a pain? Do the, does it change from series to series? How does that work for you? I get asked a lot how how you get credentials to to something. The way that I go about it, and I've I've built 
my, I guess my name and my brand is that I now have clients in a lot of these different series, but I also have friends that need help in a lot of these different series. So, you know, I'm, I have my own clients for IMSA WeatherTech and Daytona 24 and all those big races in the U S but when it comes to Le Mans and it comes to Formula One, I'm the assistant to somebody. So I'm working alongside these guys that need help and need, need extra pictures for their clients and therefore they pay me. So, you know, that's kind of the way to go about it is build a network. And if, if you just want to build a portfolio, there's so many smaller racing series across the world, whether it's in Asia, Europe or America. Like I started covering lawnmower racing in North Carolina and it is the coolest thing ever. I love lawnmower racing and they're running, they're running 60 miles an hour around a quarter, quarter mile, maybe not even dirt track. It's, I mean, it's like a bull ring and they're barely wearing helmets, no seat belts or anything, but it is awesome photography and you can go and make amazing pictures. It's not, it's really not until you get to like NASCAR, IndyCar, um, IMSA, like these big name series where you really have to start getting credentials. Everything else is just kind of like show up, you can walk around the paddock, doesn't really, no one's going to ask questions, just, just go. It's like everybody wants to just be a doctor and instead of like just going straight to being a doctor once you graduate from high school, there's so much more to it. You have to go to med school, you have to be damn good at it, and then after 10 years of work, then you're a doctor. And it's kind of the same in photography. You don't just graduate from high school and be like, I'm gonna go be the next best sports car racing photographer without putting in the work. It just takes time. And that's not something that people want to hear. They just, they want, in this day and age where everything is, is immediate, they want to hear, yeah, you just email this guy and you get a credential. That's, but that's not how it works. It's not like being on Tinder where you just swipe right and you're in, you know, you've got to really put in the work. Going off that idea that in this day and age, everyone kind of wants everything right now. I know you've kind of run into some issues recently where your work is, is being shared around without permission or, or without credit. Obviously, that, that sucks for you to not be paid or, you know, have your name on something. What's the solution to that? How does, how does a, someone get away with that? There isn't really a solution, especially to what, what happened. And without, like, saying any names or anything, basically a really well-known Formula One driver who's driving in the Daytona 24 this coming weekend right-click saved three pictures of mine off Twitter. And basically, I was standing over his car as he was getting in the car to do his first practice session. And I was like, this is a moment momentous occasion. This guy's about to run his first practice laps. I'm going to take a picture of it and post it to Twitter because I know I have friends that are journalists and you know they're all following this. They wanna see what he's gonna do. And it's just a test session, it doesn't really matter. So I, I took a picture of him on my iPhone. So I, I was working on pit lane with a helmet and fire suit and all that. And so I just pulled my phone out and put it on Twitter and hashtagged this guy and hashtagged a couple other things. And it it like got a ton of retweets and, you know, it, it made waves because it's a big name driver. And then like that night, I saw that he had put it on his Instagram and social media channels and um, had basically just stolen it off Twitter. like. And there really isn't an answer to how to stop this other than educating people and calling people out, um, which I did. And I wasn't rude about it, but like, you've got to know what's right and what's wrong with regards to media. It's frustrating because this is how we make a living. This is how myself and a lot of my colleagues, I don't have another form of income. This is it. Photography is it. So when we don't, when we take a picture, and we don't get the, the credit for having taken that picture, it's, an, it's a lost opportunity to make income for me, which pays my bills, you know, puts food on the table, allows me to go on vacation like every other person in the world. Yeah, well, I mean, you're certainly, you're a busy guy. I mean, you have, uh, of course, motorsport photography, you shoot for QC exclusive, that also means covering Panthers games. You're producing this documentary, mini documentary. I mean, are, are other photographers as busy as you and all these other things? You're all over social media. I mean, a lot of people are. There's, I, I know that there are a lot of people that are very busy. Um, but like I said, I use social media as a way to, to advertise myself and uh, advertise what I do. And it's very new age 
business marketing. And there's a lot of guys that I work around and even work with that think it's stupid and think that, you know, social media is a waste of time and it's all just like patting everyone's self on the back. Um, but it, it clearly works. I mean, I, I don't, I, I hate having to be on social media as much as I am, but you know, I, I, it is a way that I can, can market this stuff. It's, it's how we paid for that mini documentary that we're working on um, via Kickstarter that was essentially just run off of social media. Um, it's just how I advertise myself, but I, I know that there are a lot of people that are very busy, but I've always been very self-motivated and driven. Um, my father is an exceptional businessman and he taught me a lot of that business side of things. Um, and being a salesman, you know, you're, you're selling a product and I'm selling photography. I'm selling photography as my product. How do you kind of see your industry evolving in the next, you know, five, 10 years? Is photography still gonna be an important part of all this? Are our teams and drivers and motorsport community gonna to move to video I mean a lot of people have asked me that and I I really don't think that it's gonna change I think people have a sense that like photography and and journalism and print magazines are dying and they're not they're they're having a resurgence photography is having a resurgence and we we ingest our world through pictures and through tweets it's you know it's not it's not the long form New York Times article anymore where it takes two days to read the thing or even movies or, or not necessarily movies, but video. You know, why do I want to watch or why do I, why should I have to watch a 30 second advertisement before I watch a New York Times video about something when, you know, you can look at a really well made photograph and get the same story out of it. I really do think that pictures aren't going anywhere. It's as important now as it ever has been, if not more so. Um, social media is a very video driven format, but at the same time, to, to make even a 30 or 40 second video takes a crew of people and a well done one, it just takes people. And, and some, like a lot of these teams don't have the money to afford that. They don't have the talent to afford that and they the quality of their product goes down so no one wants to watch a shitty video and then have to sit down and watch it just to like see how they did in the race just give me a picture with a caption a nice picture with a nice caption and that's done it seems like in the photography world or the media world everyone kind of likes the shiny new object you know you get like a 360 video or something and in three years, no one really cares about it anymore. And uh, it seems like photography and print media has, has always been around and it will continue to always be around. Um, but just a, a quick note on, on gear, how you have to lug probably a 50 pounds of gear around a track. Is there any option other than these huge, heavy lenses? I mean, does anyone use uh, mirrorless equipment or anything in the motorsport world? There's a few guys that use mirrorless. I really respect their work. I really like their pictures especially with the electronic viewfinder i've tried it it's just not my thing like i need i want to see down a, a viewfinder and see what i'm seeing not with like pixels i want to see and i just can't do the the evfs and the i know it's gotten a lot better but the lag the shutter lag from when you actually hit the hit the shutter button to when it actually takes a picture it's minuscule but it's there and because the camera has to read that, it has to figure out what it is looking at instead of just like opening and closing a, a shutter to create the frame. N and nobody makes a mirrorless lens that is what I need it to be or a mirrorless camera that is what I need it to be for motorsport. Did you wanna talk about 18K frames at all where you uh, we are in the process there? We've been working on 18K frames since about a year ago. So we kind of started working on it and the more we worked on it, we were like, you know, people are really interested in this. This is something that no one, no one has seen before. No one has done anything on before. Motor racing around the world is hugely popular and all these pictures that people make at car races are popular, but no one sees the work that goes into covering a car race. Our goal was to cover the 2017 Daytona 24 hour and 
Um, we applied for credentials. We were accepted um, to come shoot it. And I had clients, basically this guy was gonna be there as a shadow, essentially just, he was gonna be my shadow for 40 hours plus, plus the race week buildup. And about a day after our credentials were accepted, we got an email and a phone call saying that our we had been then denied the credential because we we had funded this project through Kickstarter and we had legitimate editorial backing from multiple different outlets. Basically the series and the track didn't like the idea. They thought it was stupid. They thought no one would watch it. And we were just like, all right, we kind of have to hit the reset button. Um, so we put it on hold. We had raised over $7,000 from Kickstarter to produce this, which was amazing. Like having that support from, from my family and friends and followers around the world, like it was crazy how much support this had. We, we kind of said, all right, if we can't do something in the US because this series and this track don't believe in the idea, then let's look at going to Europe. So we, we started kind of kicking around the idea of doing the spa 24 hour and it just, it just made a lot of sense and they were totally open to the idea. And um, so we, we covered the spa 24 hour in July. Foster Peters, who's a videographer that lives in Atlanta and he does a lot of motorsport work with me. He's covered a bunch of 24 hours. He's got some big motorsport clients. He basically came and shadowed me and we shot the, the spa 24 hour together in July. And it was awesome. Like it was everything that we wanted it to be except it didn't rain, which we were kind of hoping it would rain just to give that something different, like to show that doesn't matter what weather condition it is, we've got to be out there making pictures. Probably the first time you were disappointed there wasn't any rain in a race, huh? Honestly, and that, and it was one of the things that was disappointing about not doing Daytona last year because I had so many clients at Daytona that it really would have shown a really like gritty look at what motorsport photography is like because it just it was a it was a really damn long day I, I think it was like 41 hours that i was awake i was completely spent and it rained for 19 hours during the race last year but i think it turned out really well um i've seen some pieces of it i haven't seen the final i haven't seen like the second draft of it but i'm i'm hoping to see that in the next week or so Do you have any stories of, of kind of confrontations where, you know, people didn't like you taking pictures of a certain thing or, or anything to share in that vein? Nothing too crazy. There was a couple of years ago in, in Barcelona, I had a, I don't know if confrontation is the right word, but basically there's a shot that we all do every year of the back of the F1 cars leaving pit lane. There's, it's twofold. Some people use it for shooting the diffuser of the car so especially in testing the diffuser is something that the teams really highly protect because it's that's where all the aerodynamics are like i mean it's it's a big part of of where they do their development um so there's this spot where you can you can kind of sit on the ground and it's really safe it's at pit exit it's not dangerous and uh this security guard came up and started like really physically assaulting people like grabbing people's lenses and arms and like jackets and things and and forcibly moving us from this spot and we're like what are you doing like we've some some of the guys that have been shooting there for 25 years like no joke and here we are in 2012 or 13 and she's moving us and not allowing us to shoot here and it turns out that red bull had put in a complaint to have the photographers removed from that area because they didn't want anybody photographing the cars um, and the diffusers doing spy photos. So I kind of made it a point. I was like, these idiots, like clearly somebody has no clue about digital photography because I don't have to be sitting there to make a picture of your diffuser. And I knew of a spot where you could, you could kind of get really, really low and if you time it right and you pre-focus the, the autofocus on a long lens on this one spot, you're basically seeing straight underneath of the car. Like it's an even better shot than shooting at pit lane, but they're doing a hundred and something miles an hour. And so I went up there and I shot this picture and I shot every car that went by. And um, if you expose it right, like, I mean, I'm not kidding. You can see 
all of the detail of the diffuser straight from the the rear end plate all the way underneath of the car to the nose cone and you're looking at the entire underbody of the car there's it's completely naked to you to the camera so i went back and put it on twitter and was like so red bull and um some and their like fellow teams wanted us removed from this spot because we were shooting diffusers. Is this a better spot, Mr. Nui? And I posted this picture and um and it like blew up. And it's, and it, it was just proving a point. It's like don't be like we're not out there to ruin your lives. Like I can ruin your life, but I'm not out there to ruin your life. I'm just taking pictures. Like and most of us are. We're just making a pretty picture of the back of your car and not doing spy photography. There's a few guys that are, but it's not everybody. Is is spy photography a thing in, in F1? Is that have you ever been asked to do that or Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a couple of times. It's uh it's really excruciatingly boring work. And I know a couple of the guys that do it for a living. Like there's people that do it for a living. Um it's done in, in World Endurance Championship as well. I'm guessing it won't be this year, but in past years when, uh, actually it's kind of another funny story. The, I guess it was two years ago at Le Mans, um, evidently Porsche had a picture of me up in their garage Thing, and it said that I was an Audi spy photographer, which I don't, they like, that's how wrong they were. I wasn't even work. I was working for Toyota at the time and I wasn't even doing spy pictures. I didn't even, I didn't do a single spy picture that weekend, but they had a picture of me, um, in my helmet and it was in the back of the Porsche garage that they had like a list of photographers that they were pretty sure were spy photographers. And a friend of mine like sent me it. He was like, did you know your pictures in the back of the Porsche garage? Because they think you're a spy photographer. And underneath it was like works for Audi. I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> That's cool. I guess. Yeah, I guess it'd be pretty easy to sneak around as one of those. I mean, the the lengths that some of the teams go to to spy on each other. It's amazing. Like they'll buy full on like fan kit. Like like I know that. um this past year, Porsche had a spy sitting, like they bought a grandstand seat across from the Toyota garages and they, they like kitted, kitted him up in like spot in like fan gear. But he, they had like a legit like Porsche headset on him. Like they didn't bother to like change that. And he's like sitting up there. And so every time the Toyota guys come, come in to do a pit stop, they're like writing down how long the pit stop is, what they've done, um, like the, the jack up to jack down time, the like pit lane length time, like they're, they're doing every, they're writing everything that Toyota did down and Toyota doesn't do this. They weren't, they didn't hire anybody to go spy on them. But every time we'd like run a practice session, this guy's sitting across the way in, in his seat, that's directly across from the Toyota garage. It's, it's crazy. The lengths that these teams go to, to, to really kind of mess with each other and see what everybody else is doing. That's Jamie Price. If you weren't already following him on social media, you should. He's at Jamie Price Photo. That's Jamie, J-A-M-E-Y. And he's on all the platforms. It really was a pleasure to talk with Jamie and learn about how he approaches the sport and creates some really beautiful images. You can also catch the documentary featuring him photographing the Spa 24 hour race in February. It's called Frames. That'll do it for this episode of Garage East Radio. As always, you can subscribe to us wherever you find your podcasts, and we're on Instagram and Twitter at Garage East Radio. See you next time. Take care.